This series is about understanding the reasons why people cheat and how to prevent it. It's not about condemning the act of cheating. It's about understanding it. This is because not all cheating is the same. Yes, some cheat because they're selfish and have absolutely no moral compass whatsoever, <laughs> while others cheat because their moral compass is telling them to stay in a relationship for altruistic reasons. For example, the emotional or financial welfare of children or elderly parents. Yet doing so often means enduring years or even decades of silent suffering. So I'm not taking sides on this issue. I am not saying what a cheater is doing is right or wrong because each situation is different and I don't have to walk in their shoes or their partners. I am simply presenting a series on understanding as sensitive as the subject is for many. Thanks for joining me. Why cheating almost never ends well? Well, the answer to this, in a nutshell, is, is a poor coping mechanism. I mean, I can't make it any simpler than that. For those of you who just like to get the information and go, that's it. That's the answer. Of course, it's really not that simple. I mean, there's more involved, right? I mean, let's let's talk this through. It's a poor coping mechanism for what? For somebody who is basically unwilling or unable to accept losses. It could also be because it's a way of bargaining or negotiating losses. Also, it's a way of shifting losses to a third party, maybe subconsciously, but that's what's being done. And it's also a way of avoiding real relational work, which would be addressing the core needs, wants, and values. So yeah, let's talk about this unwillingness or inability to accept losses. Maybe, maybe you've built a business with this person, or you have children with this person. A lot of years invested, and it's really hard to walk away from that and take less. Or put your children in a situation where they will be shorted significantly by a divorce. And so rather than get a divorce and face those losses, the person just stays stuck and they're trying to cope with the fact that they're not getting out of a relationship where their needs are not being met. In terms of bargaining and negotiating losses, well, it's it's like mental games. The, the person gets into this way of thinking that, well, if I get you know, sex off the side elsewhere, then I can make it. I can cope with the fact that I'm not getting my needs met at home. Well, you know, I'll just get this little need met over here. And, you know, the reality is that, and I got to say this for women, <laughs> got to say this, uh, often men who cheat, they never leave their wives. And this is because the mistress is merely there to help him cope with making a bad decision to stay in a marriage she makes it easier on him to stay because in reality he's trying to negotiate or bargain his losses he's unwilling to accept loss and so she's just there as a coping mechanism for a decision a bad decision he's committed to at some level otherwise he would have left her a long time ago and this is usually the case in many cheating scenarios there's also the issue of shifting losses to a third party. I think this is more done on a subconscious level where many cheaters are not self-aware enough to realize that the emotional loss that they're suffering is something they're trying to compensate for outside of the marriage as a way of coping with a problem that they're not resolving conclusively within their marriage. So it's a matter of coping versus resolving. And maybe they rationalize within themselves. Oh, I'm trapped or I have too much invested or there's too much to lose if I leave. But then the third party absorbs the loss because that third party will not get all of that person. They'll get the scraps or the leftovers from the spouse. And that's when this issue of loss, neglect resurfaces, begging for resolution this time reflected in another person outside the marriage. See, the problem never goes away. It just shifts and expands when one cheats. And often the cheater gets all their emotional needs met by two people who don't get the same in return. This is really unfair. Another reason why it's a poor coping mechanism is because it helps people avoid real relational work. 
which would involve addressing core needs, wants, and values in a partnership so that you don't make this mistake again. I mean, that this would involve you actually sitting down, having an open, honest conversation about how your needs and wants contrast with theirs and, you know, how you plan on meeting their needs versus how they plan on meeting yours. And yes, if you come up with incompatibilities and deficits in that conversation, you discuss, you know, what, what are we going to do? Are we going to help each other with those deficits or not? Because the reality of you is if you're not, if you're not going to help me, then that kind of either puts me in some trapped situation of lack or unresolved lack, or it puts me in coping with a lack outside of the relationship. And honestly, doing this real relational work, in my opinion, helps you to not only address and resolve the issues if possible, but if not possible, it also helps you to get really self-aware and clear within yourself as to what you need in order for a relationship to have longevity, long-term success. And when you're really aware of this and you have these conversations up front, then you are able to spare yourself a lot of unnecessary tears because you recognize early on in a relationship, you know, as wonderful as this person might be, they're not going to be able to go the distance. They're not going to be able to meet those core needs, wants, and values. And that's something that is better understood right before investing 20 years and having kids with this person and who knows, building a business together or, you know, assets. Better to know these things up front than that deep into it. Now, if you're in the situation where you do have this conversation and it becomes apparent that you or they are not compatible and you will not be helping to meet those needs in one another, a lot of times the issue of open relationships come up. You might sit down together and say, you know what, actually, we don't share core needs, wants, and values. Let's try to resolve the incompatibilities with a third party. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, very few can actually emotionally endure and withstand the imbalances that logically occur when there's triangulation. Perhaps there are exceptions under extreme cases, but if you're going to entertain such an arrangement, I suggest being very open about your insecurities and fears. I mean, think about it. What can go wrong? <laughs> I'm going to play devil's advocate here. What could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong with this? Set up ground rules and contingency plans in the event it doesn't work out. <laughs> um, trust me, I've seen some people who really pride themselves on being above all this jealousy and possessiveness and whatnot. And then they get themselves in such an arrangement and realize, no, they're, they're human and this arrangement is not for them. So I want to say this alternatively, consider something else, okay? I don't want to get too, you know, explicit here on YouTube because I know they don't go for it, but you know what I'm talking about. Maybe some devices or toys or whatever, but because I don't know how far gone the situation is, right? Like if somebody cannot physically perform, maybe that will do. <laughs> but if we're talking about, again, an emotional need that this person is not emotionally connecting to you or you don't have chemistry um, one person's drive is higher than the other, I don't know, then, I mean, there's just really no device you can buy for that, right? And, and, and to be honest with you, there's no replacement for human connection. And that's really, I think, what most of us are really needing. When we look outside of relationships, we're looking for a connection on an emotional level that we're not getting. So my advice is that you're probably better off honoring your differences, parting ways respectfully, and not betraying your core values and needs, come what losses may, than entering into an open relationship. Realize that what most people want out of sexual unions, if they're being completely honest with themselves, is connection. Real emotional connection. If you can't get that from a device, 
or a porn site, which you can't, then, you know, you can't get it from a sex-only relationship either. And I do feel that a lot of people who engage in affairs uh, want, want to compartmentalize that aspect of their lives by having an affair. Like, I, I, well, I have this little issue over here, so I'll get this one person to fix this issue. And then they wonder why. There's no real resolve until you release sexual unions that are devoid of real emotional connection to fully prioritize ones that aren't. Roving eyes will continue to wander. Bottom line here is I really want to encourage people listening to this, dealing with this issue, stop coping with the problem, resolve it. To watch the next video in the series, click here. And if you missed the last video in the series, click here. And until next time, thanks for watching, sharing, liking, commenting, and subscribing.